Welcome to today's briefing, where we cover the latest developments in global affairs. Israel has confirmed an airstrike on a Hezbollah facility in southern Beirut, escalating tensions in the region. Meanwhile, the U.S. has warned Israel of a potential halt to arms transfers unless aid to Gaza is effectively distributed. In a significant diplomatic move, President Biden reportedly cautioned Iran that any attempt on former President Trump's life would be deemed an act of war, as Iran suspends indirect talks with the U.S. Shifting focus to Europe, Ukrainian President Zelensky has outlined a victory plan that includes NATO membership as a major hurdle for Western allies. He also claims that North Korea is actively participating in the conflict on Russia's side. In response, the Kremlin has suggested that Ukraine needs to sober up regarding its ambitions. NATO's resolve remains firm, as Dutch Prime Minister Ruta affirms that the alliance will not be intimidated by Russian threats. Additionally, Russia's defense chief emphasized a common understanding with China during talks in Beijing, while European Union gas firms have been warned against pursuing a dangerous transit deal with Russia. On the Asian front, China's leader has made a rare visit to a province near Taiwan following major military exercises, and the U.S., South Korea, and Japan have announced a new team to monitor sanctions on North Korea. Lastly, Xi Jinping expressed China's willingness to be a partner and friend to the U.S. amid ongoing discussions about capping exports of Nvidia AI chips to certain countries. In lighter news, hoax bomb threats targeting Indian Airlines led to emergency landings in Canada and fighter jet scrambles in Singapore. Stay tuned as we delve deeper into these stories. Israel says it struck Hezbollah facility in southern Beirut. In breaking news, the Israeli military has confirmed a strike on an underground Hezbollah weapons storage facility in the southern suburbs of Beirut, specifically targeting Dahiye, a Hezbollah stronghold. According to Israeli authorities, the strike was carefully executed with precise intelligence about the stockpiling of strategic weapons by Hezbollah. The military emphasized that several measures were taken to minimize civilian harm, including issuing advance warnings to the population in the area. However, human rights group Amnesty International has criticized these warnings, calling them inadequate and sometimes misleading. Amnesty Secretary General Agnes Calamard stated that some of the warnings were issued less than 30 minutes before strikes, at times when people might have been asleep or offline, which posed serious risks to civilians. Amnesty also stressed that Israel's warnings do not absolve it of its responsibility under international humanitarian law to avoid targeting civilians and to minimize harm. The broader context of the conflict is dire, with the Lebanese Health Ministry reporting over 2,350 deaths and nearly 11,000 injuries in Lebanon since fighting between Hezbollah and Israel escalated over a year ago. The death toll includes both civilians and Hezbollah fighters, although the Health Ministry does not differentiate between the two in its reporting. This latest development is yet another escalation in the ongoing conflict between Hezbollah and Israel with the potential to further inflame tensions in the region. Stay tuned for more updates. U.S. warns Israel of potential halt to arms transfers if Gaza aid is not distributed. In a significant diplomatic move, the Biden administration has warned Israel that it may face consequences, including a potential halt in U.S. arms transfers if it does not take immediate steps to allow more humanitarian aid into Gaza. This warning was delivered through a joint letter from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, sent to Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant and Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer on October 13. The letter emphasizes that Israel must take action within 30 days to ease the suffering in Gaza by lifting restrictions on aid deliveries. It highlights concerns about the deteriorating humanitarian conditions in Gaza, stating that aid deliveries to the region have dropped by more than 50% since March, despite previous assurances from Israel to allow more assistance. While the U.S. has called for a dramatic increase in humanitarian aid, including at least 350 aid trucks entering Gaza daily, Israel's reluctance to act has raised tensions between the two nations. The letter also warns of policy implications under U.S. law including potential suspensions of defense articles and services if Israel fails to comply. This diplomatic pressure comes at a delicate time, with the U.S. presidential election approaching. There are concerns within the Democratic Party that discontent over the situation in Gaza could impact key swing states like Michigan, where Arab American voters have expressed frustration with the administration's stance on the Israel-Gaza conflict. Meanwhile, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza continues to worsen. 
UN officials have reported dire shortages of fuel, medicine, and food, with Israel blocking the majority of aid attempts due to concerns about dual-use items potentially benefiting Hamas. Israeli airstrikes have devastated Gaza, leaving over 42,000 Palestinians dead and much of the territory in ruins after a year-long offensive aimed at dismantling Hamas. The situation remains critical, as Israel and the U.S. navigate a delicate balance between military objectives and humanitarian needs. Stay tuned for more updates as the story develops. Biden warned Iran that killing Trump would be an act of war. Report. In a dramatic turn of events, President Biden has reportedly warned Iran that any attempt on former President Donald Trump's life would be considered an act of war. This stern message was delivered through the National Security Council as Trump faces specific assassination threats linked to Iran, stemming from the 2020 killing of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. The Trump team has been briefed on these threats and has made an unusual request for military aircraft in the final stages of the 2024 election campaign. This request reflects heightened concerns about Trump's security, as the former president remains a target of Iranian retaliation. Some $150 million a year has already been allocated to protect Trump and other officials involved in the Soleimani strike, including former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and General Kenneth McKenzie, the former head of U.S. Central Command. National Security Council spokesperson Sean Savitt confirmed that Biden's administration has taken these threats very seriously, ensuring that Trump's security detail remains updated with evolving threat information. He also condemned Iran's ongoing desire for revenge, emphasizing that the U.S. will do everything necessary to protect the former president. Interestingly, Trump himself has weighed in, urging Biden to issue a clear and direct warning to Iran, stating that any harm to a U.S. politician would lead to severe retaliation. Trump, who has already survived two assassination attempts this year, believes these threats may be linked to Iran, although no official verification has been made. The Trump campaign has made several requests to bolster security, including the use of military aircraft, armored vehicles typically reserved for sitting presidents, more flight restrictions at his events, and additional funding for local law enforcement and Secret Service protection. Biden has publicly expressed his willingness to support Trump's security needs, even joking that the only thing off the table might be offering him an F-15 fighter jet. This tense situation highlights the ongoing risks for U.S. leaders involved in critical foreign policy decisions and the lengths the U.S. government is willing to go to protect them. With Iran still seeking retribution for Soleimani's killing, the threat level remains high as Trump continues his campaign. Iran suspends indirect talks with U.S. amid rising Middle East tensions. Iran has recently suspended indirect talks with the U.S. amid escalating tensions in the Middle East. According to Iranian Foreign Minister Abbas Arakchi, this decision stems from the special situation in the region. While on a visit to Oman, Arakchi emphasized that there is currently no context for further negotiations until the present crisis is resolved. Oman has previously played the role of mediator between Iran and the West, but Arakchi indicated that this avenue will not be pursued at this time. Despite the suspension of talks, Arakchi reiterated that while Iran is fully prepared for conflict, the country does not seek war. This pause in diplomacy comes as tensions in the region have sharply escalated. Almost two weeks ago, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps IRGC launched approximately 200 ballistic missiles at Israel, prompting Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to vow retaliation. Observers are increasingly concerned that the situation could spiral into a larger war between Iran and Israel, raising fears of a broader regional conflict. Zelensky's victory plan includes a big hurdle for the West, NATO membership for Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has unveiled a bold victory plan to bring peace in Ukraine by next year, but it includes a controversial step, securing NATO membership for Ukraine while the war with Russia is ongoing. In his address to Ukraine's parliament, Zelensky emphasized that allowing Ukraine to join NATO during the conflict would show the West's commitment to supporting his country. However, this proposal presents a major challenge for some key Western allies, including the United States and Germany, who are hesitant to agree to this while fighting continues, fearing it could draw NATO into a broader war with Russia. Zelensky's plan builds on NATO's decision in July to put Ukraine on an irreversible path to membership, though the next discussions on starting formal membership talks aren't likely until the NATO summit in the Netherlands in June. For now, Countries like the U.S. and Germany are cautious, 
as NATO's Article 5, which obligates members to defend one another if attacked, could force them to confront Russia directly. In his speech, Zelensky acknowledged that Ukraine's forces are struggling against Russia's military advances, particularly in the eastern Donetsk region. This is creating an urgent need for more Western support. Yet, Zelensky is concerned that Western backing may be waning, especially with a growing focus on the Middle East and internal political changes in the U.S. With elections approaching, Washington's military aid to Ukraine could be at risk, which has been the largest source of external assistance so far. For the first time, Zelensky publicly admitted that Western allies are talking more about potential negotiations with Russia rather than focusing on delivering justice for Ukraine. He also raised the stakes by alleging that North Korea, along with Iran and China, is helping Russia in the war, with North Korea reportedly sending military personnel and ammunition. While some parts of Zelensky's victory plan remain confidential, the public aspects highlight Ukraine's strategy of continuing long-range strikes on Russian soil and targeting Russian infrastructure. Ukraine is also calling for more air defense systems and intelligence from its allies to defend against Russian attacks. Zelensky noted that Ukraine's vast natural resources, such as uranium, titanium, lithium, and graphite, are major targets for Russia, but could be key assets for post-war recovery and shared with Western partners. He also mentioned that Ukraine's experienced troops would be valuable in NATO's efforts to counter Russian aggression in the future. This ambitious plan is part of Zelensky's continued effort to galvanize support from the West, though it faces significant hurdles, especially the question of NATO membership amid ongoing conflict. Zelensky says N-Korea is de facto taking part in war on Russia's side. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has raised serious concerns about North Korea's involvement in Russia's war against Ukraine. In a recent speech to Ukraine's parliament, Zelensky stated that Ukrainian intelligence has confirmed not only that North Korea is supplying Russia with weapons, but also sending personnel to assist Moscow. According to Zelensky, North Korean workers are being said to replace Russian laborers who have been killed in the war, and some are even being deployed as personnel for Russia's military. He emphasized that North Korea's participation on Russia's side essentially makes it a second state actively involved in the war against Ukraine. This is not the first time Zelensky has made such an accusation. Last Sunday, he also alleged that North Korean personnel were being transferred to Russia's armed forces, but the Kremlin swiftly dismissed the claim as fake news. The potential involvement of North Korean troops has caught the attention of the United States as well. White House National Security Council spokesperson Sean Savitt remarked that if the presence of North Korean troops in Ukraine is confirmed, it would mark a major escalation in the defense relationship between Russia and North Korea. Washington has already accused North Korea of supplying Russia with ballistic missiles and ammunition, which both Pyongyang and Moscow have denied. However, the two nations have acknowledged that they plan to deepen their military ties, including the possibility of joint military exercises. General Charles Flynn, commander of the U.S. Army's Indo-Pacific Forces, commented that if North Korean troops' harems are indeed involved in the conflict, this would give Pyongyang an opportunity to gain real-time feedback on the effectiveness of its weapons, something that has not been possible for them before. This development adds a new layer of complexity to the war, as Ukraine continues to face not only Russian aggression, but also growing support for Moscow from North Korea. Kremlin Commenting on Zelensky's victory plan, says Ukraine needs to sober up. The Kremlin has responded to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's recently unveiled victory plan with sharp criticism, saying Ukraine needs to sober up and realize the futility of its current policies. Zelensky's plan, which was presented to Ukraine's parliament, lays out a path for ending the conflict with Russia, with a key component being an unconditional invitation for Ukraine to join NATO, along with a strategic non-nuclear deterrent package for the country. Zelensky expressed confidence that, if his plan were implemented, it could potentially bring an end to the war with Russia by next year. However, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov dismissed the plan, suggesting it was likely a camouflaged U.S. initiative aimed at using Ukraine to fight Russia until the last Ukrainian. Peskov implied that Ukraine's victory plan was driven by external forces, particularly the United States, which has been a major supplier of arms and financial support to Kiev. Peskov added that while there could be a different plan, one that might offer a more peaceful solution, it would require Kiev to acknowledge the failures of its current policies 
and reconsider the root causes of the conflict. Russia remains firmly opposed to Ukraine joining NATO, seeing the military alliance's expansion as a direct threat to its security. While Washington has played a key role in supporting Ukraine with military aid, it has made it clear that how Kyiv chooses to handle the conflict with Russia is ultimately its decision. This back and forth reflects the continuing tension and the lack of agreement on how the war could end, with Russia still holding firm in its stance against Ukrainian NATO membership and the West's involvement. NATO will not be intimidated by Russia's threats, Rutt says at Ukraine Mission HQ. NATO will not be intimidated by Russian threats, according to NATO Secretary General Mark Rutt, who made these remarks during his first visit to the alliance's Ukraine mission headquarters in Wiesbaden, Germany. The NATO Security Assistance and Training for Ukraine, NSAT-U, is set to gradually take over the coordination of Western military aid to Kyiv, a role previously held by the U.S. Ruta, speaking at the U.S. base Clay Barracks, emphasized that NATO's commitment to supporting Ukraine would not falter in the face of Russian aggression. The message to Russian President Vladimir Putin is that we will continue, that we will do what's necessary to make sure that he will not get his way, that Ukraine will prevail, Ruta stated. The NSATU headquarters, currently housed in temporary green tents, will eventually grow into a 700 personnel operation, coordinating efforts from NATO's military headquarters in Belgium and logistics hubs in Poland and Romania. This handover is seen as a strategic move to safeguard military aid coordination against the possibility of Donald Trump returning to the White House. Despite this shift, Ruti acknowledged that the U.S. remains NATO's dominant power and the largest provider of arms to Ukraine. In addition to EU's establishment, NATO's deployment of long-range U.S. SAT missiles to Germany, planned for 2026, is also drawing attention. These missiles, designed to counter the threat from Russian missile systems in Kaliningrad, have stirred debate within German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's Social Democratic Party. Nonetheless, Rutte defended the move as essential for NATO's deterrence capabilities, reaffirming that NATO is a defensive alliance focused on protecting its members, not capturing territory. As the world's strongest military alliance, NATO remains prepared to confront any threats, with Rutte emphasizing that NATO will not be intimidated by adversaries. This stance comes as tensions remain high with Russia, making NATO's support for Ukraine more critical than ever. Russia defense chief touts common understanding with China in Beijing talks. Russia's defense minister Andrei Belousov held high-level talks in Beijing this week, signaling a growing partnership between China and Russia in the face of shared tensions with the West. This meeting underscores the deepening military cooperation between the two nations, which both countries have emphasized as crucial for their strategic goals. Belousov's visit, his first since his appointment in May, was marked by discussions with top Chinese military officials, including Zhang Yuxia, vice chairman of China's Central Military Commission. According to Belousov, the two nations share common views, a common assessment of the situation and a common understanding of what we need to do together. These talks focused on strengthening their strategic partnership, reflecting the close alignment of both countries' military objectives. China and Russia have been increasing their military coordination, conducting more joint drills in recent months. This growing cooperation is seen by experts as a signal to the US and its allies, demonstrating that while China and Russia may not be formal allies, they are united in their opposition to Western influence. Zhang Yuxia echoed sentiments often shared by Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin, calling for a deeper military partnership. He stressed the importance of defending both countries' sovereignty, security, and development interests, while also working together to safeguard regional and global stability. Belousov's trip to Beijing also precedes a planned visit by Xi Jinping to Russia next week for the BRICS summit a key economic meeting that Russia and China see as a counterbalance to the U.S.-backed G7. This will be Xi's second visit to Russia since the start of the Ukraine war, highlighting the ongoing diplomatic and security ties between the two countries. The U.S. and its allies have been closely watching these developments, particularly as they accuse China of indirectly supporting Russia's war efforts in Ukraine by providing dual-use goods like microelectronics and machine tools. Despite these accusations, China continues to maintain that its trade with Russia is normal and claims neutrality in the conflict. In addition to the high-level diplomatic talks, recent military actions further underscore this cooperation. Chinese and Russian forces conducted their first joint patrol in the Arctic Ocean 
and their navies practiced anti-submarine warfare in the Pacific. This comes on the heels of several joint exercises, including those near Alaska, which prompted an interception by U.S. and Canadian forces, and others in the highly contested South China Sea. Meanwhile, as Belousov arrived in Beijing, China conducted a record number of military drills around Taiwan, flying a significant number of fighter jets and warplanes near the island. These drills were described as a warning to pro-independence forces in Taiwan, following a speech by Taiwan's president, Lai ching te where he pledged to defend the island's sovereignty against Beijing's challenges. This increasing coordination between Russia and China is being viewed as a major geopolitical shift, one that could reshape global alliances and tensions, particularly with the U.S. and its allies. EU gas firms warned over seeking dangerous Russia transit deal. In a strong statement directed at Europe's gas companies, EU Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson warned that any new deals to continue gas transit from Russia through Ukraine would be a dangerous and politically charged decision. With the existing gas transit agreement between Moscow and Kiev set to expire at the end of this year, and no deal in sight, the European Union is preparing for the possibility of completely ending Russian gas flows through Ukraine's pipeline system. Simpson, who addressed the media after a meeting of energy ministers, made it clear that the EU is fully capable of living without Russian gas, thanks to alternative supply routes and high storage levels. Her message was firm. Europe has moved beyond the point of needing Russian gas, and continuing reliance on it would be a politically perilous move, especially in the context of the ongoing war in Ukraine. She stressed that the cost of maintaining energy ties with Russia is measured not just in economic terms, but also in the lives lost due to the conflict. Negotiations between Kyiv and Moscow have been ongoing, with discussions involving potential participation from Azerbaijan to keep the pipeline operational. However, concerns have been raised that Russian supplies could be mixed into the flow in a covert manner, further complicating any potential agreement. EU officials, including Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, have taken a step back, emphasizing that it's ultimately up to Ukraine to decide the future of the gas pipeline. They have also made it clear that the EU has no intention of entering fresh talks with Russia on this matter. The current transit volume needed for smooth gas flow through Ukraine is estimated to be around 10 to 11 billion cubic meters, about 5 billion cubic meters less than current levels. This shift reflects the EU's broader effort to reduce its dependence on Russian energy following the invasion of Ukraine. Simpson's warning comes at a critical time as the EU continues to diversify its energy supplies while standing in solidarity with Ukraine. The upcoming decision regarding the gas transit deal is not just about energy security, it's also a significant political choice with far-reaching consequences for Europe's stance on the war and its relationship with Russia. China's leader makes rare visit to province facing Taiwan following major war exercises. In a significant development, China's President Xi Jinping has made a rare visit to Fujian province, which faces Taiwan. This visit comes shortly after large-scale military exercises involving China's navy, air force, missile force, and land troops, simulating a blockade of Taiwan. Beijing claims Taiwan as its territory and has expressed intentions to annex the self-governing island by force if necessary. Although Xi did not publicly address the military exercises during his visit, the timing is notable especially given that China recently dispatched a record 125 aircraft and its Liaoning aircraft carrier for these exercises around Taiwan and its outlying islands. This show of military might underscores the ongoing tensions in the region. Over the past year, Xi has limited his public appearances and foreign travels, but controlling Taiwan remains a key priority for his administration. The ruling Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army view Taiwan as integral to China's sovereignty. Taiwan's newly elected president, Lai ching te has been a vocal critic of Beijing's stance, especially after Taiwan celebrated its National Day. In his speech, Lai asserted that China has no right to represent Taiwan, and reiterated his commitment to resist any attempts at annexation or encroachment. Historically, Taiwan was a Japanese colony before being unified with China at the end of World War II. The islands separated from mainland China in 1949 when Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists fled there following their defeat by Mao Zedong's communists in the Civil War. As tensions between China and Taiwan continue to escalate, this visit by Xi and the recent military exercises serve as a stark reminder of the fragile state of cross-strait relations and the potential for conflict in the region. U.S., South Korea, 
Japan unveil new team to monitor North Korea sanctions. In a significant move, the United States, South Korea, and Japan have announced the formation of a new multinational team to monitor the enforcement of sanctions against North Korea. This initiative comes in response to Russia and China thwarting previous monitoring efforts at the United Nations. The newly established mechanism, named the Multilateral Sanctions Monitoring Team, aims to take over the work of the UN panel of experts that has been overseeing sanctions for the past 15 years. This panel's mandate was rejected by Russia earlier this year, while China abstained from the vote. The team's mission will include issuing regular reports on sanctions enforcement and will involve participation from eight additional countries, including Britain, France, and Germany. At a joint press conference in Seoul, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell, South Korean Vice Foreign Minister Kim Hong-kyun, and Japan's Vice Foreign Minister Masataka Okano unveiled the initiative, emphasizing its urgency. Vice Minister Kim highlighted the need for an effective monitoring system, stating, Even during the process of discussions, cases of North Korea violating sanctions continued to occur, so we thought we should not delay any longer. While the Allies continue to explore ways to reinstate the UN sanctions scheme, the new team is open to cooperation with any country willing to assist in ensuring sanctions are enforced. Deputy Secretary Campbell noted that Russia's veto of the UN panel's renewal was likely influenced by its illegal procurement of military equipment from North Korea for its war in Ukraine. This initiative reflects a growing concern among the Allies about illicit military transactions between North Korea and Russia, with both Moscow and Pyongyang denying arms transfers but pledging to strengthen military ties. Despite lacking the international legitimacy of a UN-backed operation, experts believe this new team could more effectively monitor North Korea, free from the influence of Moscow and Beijing. Ethan Hisok Shin, a legal analyst, emphasized the importance of targeting individuals and entities in North Korea and beyond that enable the regime to commit human rights violations. As this multinational team begins its work, it represents a concerted effort by the US, South Korea, and Japan to hold North Korea accountable and maintain pressure on the regime amid rising tensions in the region. She says China willing to be a partner, friend with the US. In a recent statement, Chinese President Xi Jinping expressed China's willingness to be a partner and friend to the United States, highlighting the potential for a successful partnership that could benefit both nations and the world. According to state media reports, she made these remarks in a letter addressed to the 2024 Annual Awards Dinner of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. She emphasized that the relationship between China and the U.S. is one of the most significant bilateral relations globally, with implications for the future and destiny of humanity. He remarked, China is willing to be a partner and friend with the United States. This will benefit not only the two countries, but the world. Despite these positive sentiments, the two nations continue to face challenges. Tensions have arisen over national security concerns, ongoing trade disputes, and China's assertive actions in the South China Sea, as well as its military drills around Taiwan. In recent months, trade relations have deteriorated, with issues such as restrictions on electric vehicles and advanced semiconductors at the forefront. President Xi reiterated China's approach to U.S.-China relations, which he said is guided by the principles of mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. He emphasized that the success of both countries should be viewed as an opportunity for mutual advancement. As both nations navigate these complex dynamics, Xi's comments reflect a desire for collaboration and a more constructive partnership that could lead to positive outcomes on the global stage. U.S. malls capping NVIDIA AI chips exports to some countries, Bloomberg News reports. U.S. officials are reportedly considering capping exports of advanced AI chips from NVIDIA and other American companies to specific countries, as reported by Bloomberg News. This move primarily targets Persian Gulf nations and aims to establish a ceiling on export licenses for certain countries, emphasizing national security interests. The discussions around this potential limitation have gained momentum in recent weeks, though they remain in the early and fluid stages. Neither the U.S. Commerce Department nor NVIDIA has commented on the matter, while Intel and AMD did not respond to requests for comment from Reuters. In a related development, the U.S. Commerce Department recently introduced a rule that could facilitate the shipment of AI chips, including those from NVIDIA, to data centers in the Middle East. This new regulation allows data centers to apply for validated end-user status, 
enabling them to receive chips under a general authorization instead of requiring individual licenses for each shipment. Last year, the Biden administration expanded licensing requirements for advanced chip exports to over 40 countries, including some in the Middle East, due to concerns about potential diversion to China and the ongoing U.S. arms embargoes. As the situation develops, the U.S. government's approach to AI chip exports continues to focus on balancing national security with economic interests in the tech industry. Hoax bomb threats to Indian Airlines force emergency landing in Canada and fighter jets to scramble in Singapore. On Tuesday, twin bomb threats targeted Indian Airlines, leading to significant disruptions across the globe. These incidents involved an emergency landing in Canada and the scrambling of fighter jets in Singapore, marking the latest in a series of hoax threats facing the country's airlines. Indian flag carrier Air India reported that the airline has experienced multiple threats recently, all confirmed to be hoaxes. Authorities in New Delhi and around the world are actively investigating these false bomb warnings. In one incident, an Air India flight traveling from New Delhi to Chicago was forced to make an emergency landing in Iqaluit, Canada, which is the country's northernmost city. All 211 passengers and crew were safely relocated to the airport, according to Canadian police. The flight, Air India Flight 127, was diverted as a precaution due to an online security threat. On Wednesday, Air India confirmed that a Canadian Air Force aircraft would assist in transferring passengers to Chicago. In a separate case, Singapore scrambled two F-15 fighter jets to escort an Air India Express plane after the airline received an email warning of a bomb on board. The flight, AXB-684, was en route to Singapore from Madurai when the threat was reported. The plane landed safely at Changi Airport, where it was handed over to airport police for further investigation. This wave of threats has disrupted multiple flights from Indian carriers, including domestic flights and international routes. For example, an Air India flight from Mumbai to New York was diverted back to Delhi due to a hoax bomb alert. Additionally, two Indigo flights bound for Oman and Saudi Arabia were significantly delayed. SpiceJet also reported a bomb threat for a flight to Mumbai from Darbanga, which landed safely and was isolated as a precaution. The airline conducted security checks before allowing the flight to continue its operations. While it's unclear if the threats are connected or what might be motivating them, Air India emphasized that all threats are taken seriously and they are collaborating with authorities to hold those responsible accountable for the disruption caused to passengers. Amid this turmoil, India's Ministry of Civil Aviation is reportedly convening to discuss the ongoing situation. These events unfold against a backdrop of heightened diplomatic tensions between India and Canada, which recently expelled six Indian diplomats over accusations of Indian government involvement in violence against Sikh separatists in Canada. While there's no indication that the bomb hoaxes are related to these diplomatic tensions, the incidents have stirred memories of the tragic 1985 bombing of Air India Flight 182, a devastating attack that killed 329 people 